My name is David Benoit, and that's French. Most people think all Frenchmen, tall, dark, and handsome. My figure one out of three ain't bad. But you know, down in Louisiana, I tell Cajun story. I had a lady tell me one time, she said, I knew where you're from just by the way you talk. I said, ma'am, you don't know where I'm from just by the way I talk. Because they don't talk like this down in Louisiana. And they got different names like Boudreaux, Thibodeau, Fontenot, Hebert. And so it, this is a totally different group down there. And, uh, you know, down in New Orleans, that's a pretty rough place, you know. And, and one time Father Hebert went down there to New Orleans and went to Bourbon Street, which is a bad, bad place. And he saw Boudreaux, Thibodeau, and Jay Boy Fontenot. And he walked over there and said, hey, Jay Boy, let me ask you a question, boy. He said, yes, sir, Father. He said, you want to go to heaven? He said, oh, yeah. He said, then you go stand right over there. He went over there. He looked at Thibodeau. He said, Thibodeau? He said, you want to go to heaven, boy? He said, oh, yes, sir. He said, you just go stand right over there. And then he looked at Boudreaux. He said, Boudreaux, do you want to go to heaven, boy? He said, no, sir. He said, you mean to tell me when you, go, when you die, you don't want to go to heaven? He said, yeah, when I die, but I thought you was taking a load right now. <laughs> uh, kind of, I'll tell another one real quick. It's not totally a Cajun story, but you know down in Louisiana, they, they still have parishes. It's, not, it's so Catholic-oriented, they don't even counties they have parishes. And uh, the associate minister stood up and he said, I make $500 a month, and that is not enough. And the father gets up and he goes, I make $800 a month, and that's not enough. The piano player gets up. She goes, I make $1,400 a month, and there's no business like show business like no business I know. I, I got to quit cutting up here. Well, I'm glad you're here today, and I'm glad to be here this morning. And, you know, it's interesting. I've spoken all across America. I've spoken in every state in the Union, including Alaska and Hawaii. And my expertise is dealing with the occult. And you would think as I'd go to fundamental Bible-believing churches, everybody in that church, when I talk about the devil, should say amen, right? But you know what? I talk about the devil in some churches. I make some people mad. But I can be mad, too, if somebody talked about my daddy. You see, not everybody says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. And the Bible says, ye are of your father, the devil, lust of your father, you will do it. The Bible tells us to be not ignorant of Satan's devices, lest he deceive us. Now, you know there's a difference between being ignorant and there's a difference between being stupid. Now, I'll give you an example. Suppose I'm driving down the road here. I've never been down this road before, and I'm driving. It's 35 mile an hour. I'm doing 45 mile an hour. All of a sudden, I look in my rearview mirror. And there's a police officer. He says to me, he says, Sir, do you realize you were doing 45 miles an hour? And it's the 35 mile an hour zone. I said, No, sir. I, I've never been down this road. I didn't know that. Oh, the police officer looks at me and says, Oh, hey, listen, you didn't know that. He, he, I'm going to let you go because you just didn't know that. No, he's going to give me a ticket, right? Why? Because I was ignorant of the law, but just because I'm ignorant of the law does not mean that I'm not responsible for the law, right? Now, let me show you what stupidity is. Stupidity is I live down that road, and I'm driving 55 mile an hour instead of 35 mile an hour, and a police officer pulls me over. And I wave at him as I pass him by. That's stupidity. You see, the Bible tells us not to be ignorant of Satan's device, but he also tells us that we need to put on the whole armor of God. And if you'll take your Bibles, I'm going to go to Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to look at that this morning, Ephesians chapter 6, putting on the whole armor of God. You know, sometimes people believe that this is a playground. The Bible never calls earth the playground. It calls it a battlefield. We are on the battlefield. This is war. You know, some people in the military, they'll dress up 
in their nice suits and they'll go to gayas and stuff like that. And then you've got a, a uniform that you wear in battle. I'm afraid that most Christians are dressed for some kind of gaya when they should be dressed for warfare. That's what our problem is today. So we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 6 and see what the scripture has to say about it. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now you notice what it said? In the power of his might. It's not about how strong I am. It's not about how powerful I am. It's how powerful God is. That makes a big difference, folks. I'm not coming in my name. I'm coming in his name. I mean, de the devil's so crafty, he talked one-third of all the angels out of heaven. He's pretty crafty. Don't think that he could talk you right into hell from the pew, too. He's very clever. And this is the battlefield, and this is the battlefield of the world, and the Bible tells us to put on the whole armor of God, and it tells us that it's not our strength. It's not how great I am. I don't look in the mirror in the morning and say, how great thou art. How great. No, it's not about me. It's about him. And if it's about you, you're in trouble. Because you're no match for the devil and his demons. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual principal against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You know, we live in such a secular world today, we don't realize that there is a spiritual battle going on. Even Christians, this COVID-19, all this other stuff's going on, you can't go to church, you can't do this, you can't. that's a spiritual thing, folks. No one man or no group of men or women could put this all together. It's impossible. It has to be done in the supernatural. Some way, somehow, it's happening. And I believe because it's setting up for the one, new world order. I believe it's setting up for the one world government. I believe that it's setting up for the Antichrist to set on his throne, which will be a short-lived thing. Amen. So if you, if you all understand that, then we're all on the same page. It says this, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, verse 13, that you may be able to withstand in the evil days, having done all to stand. Do you, do you believe that we're living in evil days? We're living in very evil days. We're living in a time when good is bad and bad is good. This morning I was teaching a Sunday school class and I was talking about how our country have, has released thousands, tens of thousands of convicted convicts into society because of the coronavirus. And then I talked about two guys up in New Jersey who own a gym and they want to put them in prison for opening their gym. Now, get this picture. They let criminals, rapists, drug dealers, everything out of prison. And then they want to put people who want to work into prison. We're living in very evil days, folks. We're living in a day when good is evil and evil is good. But by, the Bible says, woe unto him that calls good evil and evil good. We're living in evil days. We're living in a time when... Homosexuality is, is, is normal, and having a mom and dad in a home is abnormal. That's a sad thing, folks. That's a sad. See, we are watchmen on the wall. We're supposed to send out a blast and let people know when the enemy's approaching. The enemy's right here, and we haven't said diddly squat. We're just sitting on the fence somewhere. But let me tell you something, folks. It's coming, and it's coming very quickly. You know... They're talking about the politics. They say, you know, preachers ought not talk about politics or anything. Can I tell you something, folks? Daniel went to the lion den because of it. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego went to the fire furnace for it. But see, folks, even Peter and Paul, they all went to prison. Why? Because of man-made laws that caused us to hinder the gospel. That's the problem. When... Stores that sell alcohol are essential businesses, and churches aren't. There's something seriously wrong with America. Something seriously wrong with America. And then it says this. Stand therefore having your loin girt about with truth. Now Paul is looking at this, this 
probably a Roman soldier and he's looking at his garb and stuff like that. The Bible says that we need to have our loins girt about with truth. Now, back in those days, these men did not have fatigues like we would have to go out to battle. They had long tunics, long dresses. And what they would do is they would tie it up and it would lift the hemline up so they wouldn't step on it. Ladies, you know what I'm talking about. You got a long dress, you put a belt on, it pulls up. I was giving this message in San Francisco some time ago and I think some of the men knew what I was talking about. But could you imagine being in the heat of battle and all of a sudden you step on your hemline? You wouldn't do it but one time. Have you ever heard somebody say, why, he tripped over his own lie? You ever hear that? That's what it's talking about right here. And the thing about lying is if you're going to lie, you better have more than one lie. And you know the interesting thing about it is that women know how to ask questions. Am I telling the truth? Women know how. Men don't know how to ask questions. I'll give you an example. Little Johnny, he goes by his, his dad and says, see you later, Johnny. I'm going. And he, Johnny just like leaves. You don't do that with your mama. You walk by mama. See you later, mama. I'm going to Johnny's house. Johnny who? How old is he? Has he ever been to penitentiary? She's going to ask you 30 questions before you get out of that place. But I'm not belittling women. That's God made you that way. Men just say, go ahead. See you later. Yeah. No. Hey, but you know what? Men have learned how to lie without lying. It's called the sin of perversion. It means to distort the truth. It's not really lying. It's just not really telling the truth. For example, I heard a story one time about a preacher who was having a revival, and he and the evangelists were about to walk out the door at the end of the service, and this dear little old saint walked up and said, Brother Pastor, I baked you a pie. For you and the evangelists. Boy, that night, the evangelists and the pastor that got home, boy, they cut it up and they each took a bite of it. Look at it. That's the worst tasting pie I have ever tasted in my life. And they threw it in the trash can. Well, the next night, they come back to church and here's that dear little old saint. She said, Brother Pastor, what would you think about my pie last night? He stopped. He said, ma'am, let me tell you something. Pie tastes like that don't last long around our house. <laughs> it didn't. It went right in the trash. He didn't lie. He just didn't tell the truth. My stepfather's a gourmet cook, and he could kick anything, but his mother couldn't cook a lick. So when he goes over and eats at somebody's house and he doesn't like what they cook, he goes, that's just like Mama used to make. <laughs> it's not lying. It's just perverting the truth. The Bible says we need to have our loins girt about with truth. And then having on the breastplate of righteousness. Folks, the breastplate, it would have been near suicidal to go out to, the, to battle without the breastplate. They had swords. They had spears. They had all these different things that, that would kill you if you didn't have your vital organs covered. The Bible tells us that we need the breastplate of righteousness. And you know what? It doesn't seem like that's anything about that anymore. You don't hear about that anymore. I mean, you turn on your children or grandchildren's television stations, and most of it's witchcraft. It's all about witchcraft and demonism and stuff like that. You know, you go out, and what used to be abnormal is now normal. Things that used to be outside the church are now accepted in the church and stuff. They now have ministers who are homose openly homosexuals and things like that. What's wrong, and, and, and I'm not just going to say that. I'll say there are some preachers who are living immoral lives just as well, and they're wrong too. So it's not just about sexual orientation. It's about sin. Something's wrong. But the Bible says, put on the breastplate of righteousness. And then it says, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, the shoes were important. As a matter of fact, it was the only piece of clothing that lasted 40 years. Think about that, ladies. One pair of shoes, 40 years. No, I got a pink pair for Thursday, gray pair for the four. I got a pair for every, No, one pair for 40 years. And you know something, folks? These shoes are important because when you're in the heat of battle, they fought in the sand. And let me tell you something, I used to live down in Lake Charles, Louisiana, and they had a beach there. I used to go down to the beach, and these big bullies used to kick sand in my face. They don't do it anymore. 
I quit going to the beach. But you know what I'm talking about. You go out there, and they don't have any shoes on, and next thing they go, ooh, ah, ooh, ah, ooh, ah, ooh. And then they scoot the sand and go, ah, ooh, ah, ooh, ah, ooh, ah, scoot the sand, right? Could you imagine being in the heat of battle going, ooh, ah, ooh, ah, ooh. The shoes are important. And these shoes are to spread the gospel. And you know the sad thing about it is some people think they're spreading the gospel and not spreading the gospel. Some people are actually Christians who are hindrances to the gospel. I had a lady one time ask me, she said, would you go talk to my friend? Oh, boy, I'd sure like to see her go to heaven. I went and talked to her friend. Her friend said, I'd become a Christian, but my friend, if that's what Christianity is all about, I don't want to be one. She was a hindrance. And, you know, it's interesting. Uh, what will happen is on Sunday, you know, people go to restaurants and they act like the devil. I mean, take that back. I don't want that. And you're all dressed up, you know. They know you just came from church. And, and, and you, you don't tip. You see the three types of givers, tithers, tippers, and tightwads. And they don't give anything. They complain about everything. Let me tell you something. If you are going to go to a restaurant this afternoon and act like the devil, why don't you go home and put on a Budweiser T-shirt? Maybe people quit drinking Budweiser because you know what? If they see you come from church, that you're their excuse for not going to church. I'd go to church, but I won't work on Sundays because I don't want to deal with the Christian crowd. That's a sad commentary. Folks, we need, there, there's no song, if you're happy, notify your face. Take that frown off and put a smile in its place. If you love Jesus, share with the human race. If you're happy, notify your face. Do you realize that a smile is contagious? I see some of y'all is immune. <laughs> but smiling is contagious. I mean, I speak in China. I've spoken all over the world. I've been to Russia, South Africa. I mean, I've been places. And you know what? A universal language is a smile. Doesn't matter where you're at. It still means the same thing. You see these people that are in our country. They can't speak a lick. English. You say, hello. They go, your mother's ugly. They don't know anything. They're just going to smile because smiling is a universal language. And then it says this. And above all, taking the shield of faith, with which ye shall be able to quench the, all the fiery darts of the wicked. Now, from what I gather in history, this is not a small shield. It wasn't like you'd see in some of these movies where they're having individual shields. These were huge shields. And what they would do is they put these big, sh huge shields, and they would walk, and they'd shoot their darts, and it would hit the, the shield, and they'd march, and they'd shoot and hit the shield until they could get close enough to do hand-to-hand -hand combat. We need the shield of faith. You know, the Bible says it is impossible to please God outside of faith. Now, let me tell you something. If it's impossible with God, it's impossible. See, there's some things David can do that I can't do. There's some things I can do that David can't do. There's some things you can do that he can't. We all can do some things that some people can't do. But let me tell you something. If God can't do it, it can't be done. Now, let me ask you a question. David, could you walk through that wall? Just, just walk right through. I'm not talking about the door. Just walk right through the No, it's impossible. Now, you could break your nose trying to do that, but that's impossible. But if God told you to walk through that wall, could you walk through the wall? Yeah, you better hope God told you or you break your nose. <laughs> he, if, if, that's not impossible. Walls are not impossible for, for God's people to go through if God tells you to go through, right? Now, let me ask you another question. How many in this room could flap your arms and fly around the room? That's impossible. But if God told you to do it, can you do it? Yes. Because one of these days he's going to say, come up hither, and we're going to go up. Let me ask you this. Can you walk on water? Not ice. I know how some of you Baptists think. Can you walk on water? <laughs> no. But if God tells you to walk on water, can you walk on the water? Yeah, now here's my point. Ready for the big point? The point is, it would be easier for you to walk through that wall than to think you could please God outside of faith. 
It would be easier for you to fly around this room than to think you can please God outside of faith. It would be easier for you to walk on water than to think you can please God outside of faith. Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. I mean, we know how to please our children. We know how to please our wives. We know how to make our husbands happy. We know how, but do we really know how to make God happy? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And then it says this, and take the helmet of salvation. Now, most people, that's all they got on. I call them spiritual streakers. Because all they got on is a hat and a smile. <laughs> forget about the breastplate. Forget about the shoes. But look at this hat. You like that hat? That's all they walk around with. They look kind of strange in here today with someone just a hat. But you know what? If spiritually we were to show what armor we have on today, some of us, that's all we'd have is a helmet. I'm not trying to put a vivid picture in your mind. I'm just saying Take on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Let me tell you something. When Jesus combated the devil, he used the Word. The devil does not flee at philosophical ideas. You can't defeat the devil in his army by your trying to talk with him. You have to use the Word. If Jesus used the Word, that is our offensive weapon. But you know something, folks? There's another offensive weapon. I'm sure some of you heard, the only offensive weapon that we have is the Word of God. No, that's not true. We have another offensive weapon. It's found in the next verse. Praying always with all prayer and supplication. Do you realize that prayer is an offensive weapon? If you've ever been in the military, you're glad when you can... Talk to the other person on the other side. It's good for them to let you know that they're coming. It's good for you to let them know that you're there. Let me tell you something. When you're in a foxhole and they're dropping bombs, you want to have communication. Communication is key to any battlefield. You know, when Saddam Hussein had that, the largest army in the world, we flew our jets at very low levels and we blew out all their communications. So all he had was a lot of people who didn't know what to do. And you know what? That's what the devil will try to do with you. The first thing the devil will try to do for you is he'll cut out your prayer life. Before a man ever leaves his wife, he'll stop praying. Before a woman ever leaves her husband, she's going to stop praying. Before a person ever steps out of the church and says, I'll never step foot in this church again, they had stopped praying. Because as soon as the devil can cut your prayer life off, then he can control you. Do you know how to pray? Oh, I pray. I'm going to show you about prayer. You know, the fact that when you go to pray, this, this shows you that there is a su supernatural thing happening. Because when you go to pray, have you ever said, I'm going to pray, Lord, I'm going to pray for an hour, Lord, I'm going to pray for an hour. And I mean, you say, dear Lord, and all of a sudden your mind goes all over the place, right? I know, I'll give you an illustration. <clears throat> a lady, she says, I'm going to pray for an hour, Lord, I'm going to pray for an hour. <clears throat> dear Lord, I thank you that you are the bread of life. Bread. I need milk too. And you know, I didn't put... And you'll go through your whole grocery list, right? But men aren't any better than men. I say, okay, Lord, I'm going to pray, Lord. I'm going to pray for an hour. <clears throat> Dear Lord, I thank you that you are the light of the world. Light. You know, the light's been burned out about a week in my, in my garage, and I hadn't seen my tools. Lord, I'm going to kill my son when I get up. I mean, your mind goes all over the place, right? Or is it just me? <laughs> is it just me? No. When you go to pray, Satan is going to try to... What do they call that? Scrambling communications? When you're in the military, jamming communications. They'll try to commun block your communications. And when Satan has got your mind going all over the place, he's trying to destroy your communications 
so that you cannot find power, that you cannot find relief, that you cannot find what, you, what is necessary for that battlefield because he wants to destroy us. Because once he destroys your communication, it's all over. David's a pilot. Let me tell you something, folks. If he loses his communication, it's all over for a bunch of people. There's nothing any more important to a pilot than communications. Am I right, David? He's got to know when he can land, when he can't land. He's got to know what direction he's going. He's got, he's got to know all those things. He's in communication with towers all across America. And they're telling them where the planes are and where they're not, and where you can go, where you can't go. Communication is vital in the spiritual warfare, folks. Well, I'm going to close with this last story. I boxed for seven years, had offers to fight professionally when I was in college. And I remember one time we had a, a tournament, and my cousin had never boxed in his entire life. And he's getting his hands wrapped, and all of a sudden this guy walks up and says, Say, man, you know who you fight fighting tonight? My cousin goes, I don't know. You fight me, Jack, and I'll tell you what, when I hit you, you better run. Scared my cousin to death. He got in that ring that night, put his arms over the rope like that, looked at the old guy, the old guy giving him the evil eye. You know the evil eye. I'll knock you out. You ever football player? <laughs> you know, and you go. <laughs> I mean, they give you the evil eye. They get mean with you. I'll knock you out. You better run. Boy, my cousin sitting there, he thought that was pretty good. His knees started to applaud. <laughs> and about that time, he came out and he had them big old gloves and 16 ounce. You couldn't see too well. And there's a lull in the action. And he peeked over his glove. When he did, that guy popped him right in the mouth. Now, I don't know if you know anything about an amateur boxing, but in an amateur boxing, you go three rounds. My cousin went three rounds. He went around that ring three times. That old guy beating him on the back of his head. They stopped the fight. If he was going to bust his nose, he'd have to crack his skull. He wasn't getting to the front no more. Well, they stopped the fight. Well, it just so happened that the next night, the same guy that fought my cousin was going to have to fight my brother. Now, let me tell you something about my brother. My brother loved to fight. He'd fight him in the ring, and then he'd fight him out the ring. My brother would have made a good evangelist because he wasn't leaving until he got a decision. <laughs> so my brother was getting his hands wrapped, and the old boy said, Free man, you know who you fighting that? No. He said, you fighting me. And the guy last night, he was smart. When I hit him, he ran. Well, first of all, he didn't know that my brother loved to fight. Secondly, he didn't know that he was telling my brother he was the guy that beat my cousin up pretty bad. Two bad things for him. So that old guy, he's standing on the ropes like that. He's waving his My brother's looking around like that. And I kid you not, as soon as that bell rang... My brother literally ran that guy's corner boop, 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 and knocked him out right there. He never got out of the corner. He was like that when my brother got there. He, my brother hit him and he hit the floor. It was all over. Now, I know what some of y'all are thinking right now. Where is that man going with that story? <laughs> well, there is a principle behind that story. You know the difference between my cousin and my brother? My cousin was whipped before he ever got in the ring. The devil will beat you up here before he ever beats you out there. He'll say, you can't tithe. You won't be able to have enough money to pay your bills. He'll tell you, you can't, you can't witness because somebody's going to reject you. He's gonna, he beats you up here before he ever beats you out there. But the Bible says, greater is he that is in us than he that is with them. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for this time. I thank you for this opportunity.